in these very different days that we are experiencing due to the COVID-19 virus. It's a little different, certainly. It's a little awkward at times. Uh, but certainly it is so appropriate for God's people to continue to worship together. And so for those of you who have uh, tuned in uh, this morning, on this uh, Sunday morning, it is certainly our prayer that you may experience the blessing of our God. And even though you can't fellowship together with other members of the congregation, that you can sense, you can in your own uh, heart's mind, you're able to, to know that you are part of a body of believers. There, there is still that incredible tie that binds our hearts together in, in Christian love. And so we begin our worship service this morning with these words taken from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength and seek his face always. It's an opening song of praise, singing, Behold Our God.
In the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah quotes these words, words that come from God himself as he speaks to his people, come. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sin be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. Though it be red like crimson, it shall be as wool. God calls us to come into his presence, but he calls us in order that we might acknowledge our own unworthiness, that we might come acknowledging that the only way that we can have fellowship with our God is through the blood, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Join me in a prayer of confession. Heavenly Father, we do come this morning to acknowledge our own unworthiness. We come this morning to confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have come this morning to acknowledge that there is none righteous, no, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray. But you have called us. Even as you sought out Adam and Eve in the garden, you call us by name. You, you call us in order that in hearing your voice and in recognizing our own guilt, we might humble ourselves and in genuine penitence come before your throne of grace and mercy to acknowledge that we are sinners, that we, like the publican of old who stood in a, in a corner and did not even dare lift up his eyes to heaven, says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. So too, we come in order that we might humbly acknowledge and confess the sins that cling to us, in order that you in your righteousness and in your justice, in hearing our prayers of confession and through the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that you might be able to pronounce over us those incredible words, my child, your sins are forgiven. It is that message that we hear again today, and it is that message that gives hope, encouragement, and assurance to us as God's children. Hear our prayer, for Christ's sake, amen. We do know that for those who confess their sins, God is both faithful and just and will forgive us of all our sin and iniquity. And for those who have experienced that forgiveness, it should be our heartfelt desire to live a life of gratitude. Paul talks of that life of gratitude in the letter that he writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 3, where Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And then Paul goes on and describes what that earthly nature is like. But for those of us who have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator, for those of us who have experienced what it means to be forgiven, Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other, and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Hey guys, man do I miss you. Let me take a photo of you guys on the couch in your pajamas. I might need this later, just a moment. Oh shoot, looks like my phone's dead. Just a minute. See, I was texting my friend and she was texting me. You know how it goes. Anyway, so. You know, sometimes we are like the cell phone. Sometimes we need to recharge. So how do we recharge? We recharge by plugging into God, by going to his word, by praying, by going to church. Now, I know that you can't go to church right now, but by tuning into things like this, you're still a part of church. When we have struggles, things like this coronavirus, by tuning into God, that is how he will recharge us. Now, it doesn't happen instantly. I don't just plug my phone in and it's supercharged. It takes time. But by tuning into his word, by praying more, he will recharge you. Will you guys pray with me? Father, help us to stay plugged into you. Help us to know that when we pray and study your word, we are getting a charge. And if we are patient, we will see your strength shining anew in us. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you soon. At this time, will you join me in a time of congregational prayer? But before we do go to God in prayer, I want to share with you an announcement concerning one of the young ladies, one of the little girls who attends the Sanborn Christian School, we want to take note of the fact that little Jewel Hoffman, daughter of Jerry and Sarah Hoffman, was diagnosed with cancer recently. And uh, what we do know is that the road ahead looks very difficult for the family. It looks like a very long road of chemotherapy the real possibility, the likelihood of possibly a leg being amputated below the knee. Uh, certainly the kind of uh, challenge that uh, weighs heavy, especially for parents at a time like this. And so as a Christian community, we certainly want to remember the Hoffmans, and certainly as uh, fellow students at Sanborn Christian, we certainly want to surround little Jewel with, with our, our prayers. With that, join me in a time of prayer. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we come before your throne of grace and mercy in the morning hour of this day, confessing that this is the day that the Lord has made, and may we rejoice and be glad in it. We give you thanks, Heavenly Father, for your fatherly providential goodness, which is new each and every day. We give you thanks today that as we look around about us and see the evidence of the changing of the seasons, the new buds, leaves coming out in the trees, some of the early flowers like tulips blossoming, we are reminded of your covenant faithfulness to the whole of creation. We are reminded that you are the one who declares that there will be springtime and harvest, summer and winter, all according to your fatherly providential goodness, your sovereign control. And so we thank you again this morning. As we come into your presence, we thank you for for the many, many little blessings that touch our life from day to day, for food on our tables, for family and friends, for the opportunities that you give us for gainful employment. And yes, we are very conscious of the fact that right now we are living in a difficult time with the challenges of the COVID-19 virus. And we understand that this is difficult with the fact that our children cannot be in the classroom, 
the fact that some of us may not be able to go to our places of employment, the fact that we cannot gather as we would like, the very fact that we cannot gather as brothers and sisters in Christ on a Sunday morning, all of this creates all kinds of tension and uncertainty and yet we know that you are the one who is in control. You are the one who not only sovereignly rules and reigns over all things, but that everything has a purpose. And so we, in humble childlike trust, pray that you will create within each and every one of our hearts the childlike trust the childlike trust that a child has when a child is able to say to mom or dad in the midst of a very violent storm, and mom and dad say, you are safe. My child, you are with me. Even more so, can we hear our Heavenly Father say to us, you, my child, are safe. For there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can ever separate us from your love. And so with childlike trust, we face the uncertainties of a new day, the uncertainties that sometimes weigh heavy on our hearts and minds, but we trust in your fatherly goodness. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this congregation, your people gathered here in this community, Sanborn Christian Reformed Church. We pray, Heavenly Father, for each and every member, for each and every family. You know the particular concerns, the needs of each and every family, of each and every individual. We lay them all before you this morning. In a very special way, Heavenly Father, we, we pray that you will be with the family of Maureen Prince, who passed away. We pray that you will surround the loved ones of this family with your precious promises and your comforting grace. May they be able to cling to the precious promises that for those who believe in him who is the resurrection and the life, not even death itself can separate us from that love. We also in a very special way want to lift up Ben and Tina Myers and their children to lift up Jerry Bosma, Judy Visser. We also, in a very special way, Lord, want to pray this morning for Jerry and Sarah Hoffman. We pray, Lord, that you will surround them with your grace, your word of encouragement in this difficult time. And in a very special way, we lift up Jewel as she faces, as this little child faces a difficult, difficult road ahead. That you will not only give her day to day the strength that she needs physically to endure the chemo, but most of all that she may know from day to day that she is a very precious child of yours. May that give encouragement and hope. For others, Lord, within this congregation, within the broader circle of the household of faith, for those who are brothers and sisters in Christ in far off lands, mindful of the fact that uh, this virus that has certainly brought about a great deal of pain and suffering and loss within our own country, keenly aware of the fact that it has impacted people in many different countries. And certainly, we are very much aware of the fact that this has certainly impacted brothers and sisters in those lands as well. And so we lift up your people. We lift them up and pray that for those who live in countries where there's a real scarcity of quality health care, where there are or were already economic issues, 
that in this environment in which your people are already faced with many, many hardships, that, that this new hardship, which certainly is very overwhelming, that your people may be able to cling again to your precious promises, that they may be able to find hope in an otherwise hopeless situation, and that these brothers and sisters, along with us in this time, in this very difficult time, that we may give witness to the only hope that we have, the only hope that this world has, to be able to face life with all of its uncertainties, that we are able to face life with the assurance, the incredible knowledge, comfort, that our God reigns. And that in and through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there is hope. There is hope for now, today, and there is hope for tomorrow, and there is the assurance of life, eternal life, with you as our God for all eternity. We pray for those who are in positions of authority. We pray for our country. We pray for countries around the world. And again, in this difficult time, we pray that such men and women may be endowed with wisdom and insight and understanding that those who are in positions of authority may do what is good, what is right, what is just, that they may be those who give a good account of the authority which you have given to these individuals, and that they may do that which is for the good of the citizens that are under their care. Lord, as we face a new week, as you go with us in the challenges that we will face in this new week, we pray that you will give guidance, that you will encourage us, that you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, will equip us to be faithful witnesses of yours in this troubled time, and that as we face each and every new day, that we may do so knowing that it is our heart's desire to love you with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that it is our heart's desire to love our neighbor as we ought to love ourselves. Encourage us to be your sons and daughters. Encourage us to live our lives in a way that gives evidence that you are our Father, we are your children, and that we face each new day with the calm assurance that you, our Heavenly Father, have all things in your hand. We ask now that you will hear the prayers of your people, and we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Western is so much more than a school. Western is, uh, plays a vital part in the community. Christian education is so important because it builds on what the child has learned at home, that everything, everything is in God's control. The challenges for Christian education are not diminishing. You know, everything's changing. I had a strange thing happen that one time in that all of a sudden a kid asked me, did you teach my grandpa? <laughs> and I thought that is something that shows the legacy of Western. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> and that was true. I taught his grandpa, his parents, and now him. It is not just a place where we're here to to play an instrument or to shoot a basketball, although those are things that are critical to the value of Christ-centered education, we are committed to serving the whole child, using the Bible for our total curriculum. Christian education 
helps our lives and how we further develop our children and how they go out and they further the kingdom and how they can be outreaches. I guess we look at, at God as being sovereign over all. Why not education? He's important for our work, our marriage, finances. How can we not include Christian education or Christ-centered education in that? Being brought up in a, a Christian perspective, all walks of life, in the classroom, from athletics to music and arts, that everything that was taught was done from a Christian perspective. One of the greatest impacts for me personally uh, was a mentor that I had here at Western Christian High School. This teacher uh, was able to uplift me when times were tough, and this teacher constantly encouraged me. I think the age that you start high school at to where you finish at, there's a lot of growing up that happens, and teachers encouraged us to, to build those relationships. They were working to bring us together you know, as a community, as a school, and a lot of friendships were made and developed and exist to this day, 30 some years later. When my dad talks about not going through Christian education and the things that he has learned with us going through Christian education, just the different memorization of Bible passages, what we would um, think of as common Bible knowledge, he did not learn or did not have implanted until when we were going through school and still are. I think Western has so many great teachers. You know, all the teachers here, they genuinely care about us as students. You know, they um, want to get to know us, um, um, just what's happening in our lives. Well, one of my children has a medical condition with chronic migraine. I've really been able to see how the teachers care for her. I've had teachers and staff members tell me that we're praying for her. We're praying for your child. And that to me is, been such a blessing to know that they care about your child as a whole person, not just how they're doing academically, but how they're doing spiritually, socially, emotionally, and their physical health as well. Western has been such a blessing, not only to me, but also to my family and to my children, to see them grow as godly people and to see them embrace how important it is to further his kingdom and to be a disciple and, and to understand that they have a place in God's world and, and God is using them and molding them and moving them forward for his kingdom work. It's just been remarkable and uh, I get so emotional <laughs> thinking about that. It's, it's been such a blessing in our family uh, of all the generations that have gone through this this school and, and what it has been uh, for each one of them. I think the value of education is equipping kids, giving them the tools they need to figure out how they can continue to grow and to learn and to serve God. I recently ran into a Western Christian alum and they told me that they established incredible mentors here in the teachers. And this student specifically said that they have goals to be like a teacher at Western. I want my children to go to a school like that. Serving the King is, it's, it's every day from the minute you wake up in the morning to the minute you lay your head on the pillow. But I'm not my own, but belong to God, body and soul. On behalf of the deacons, we would like to thank our church family for your continued love and support. Thank you for your continual prayers, and thank you for your continued support of all our ministries, benevolence, budget, CES, missions, and our GOAT ministry. There is opportunity for you to drop off your gifts at the drop box on the west side of church or to mail them in as well. And we would also encourage you, if you so desire to call any of us as deacons or elders if you have a prayer concern or if you have a financial hardship or if you simply want to chat. 
And we would also love to hear if, uh, if God has been using this time to draw you closer to him or bring your family closer during this unprecedented time. We have heard stories like this and they are very encouraging. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today. We thank you for being a wonderful, loving, majestic God. We are so thankful for you watching over our church family and our community. We are thankful for the family of God. We come to you with heavy hearts for our beloved young friend, Jewel Hoffman, who has been diagnosed with cancer. We pray that you will bless and comfort Jerry and Sarah, Colt, Titan, Lily, and Dirk, and her whole family, and that you will wrap them in your loving arms, and that you will guide the doctors as she goes through her chemotherapy. We thank you for being the great physician. We pray that you will be with our widows and widowers. We pray that you will continue to comfort the Marine Prince family, and we pray that you will alleviate anyone with extra stress in their lives at this time. In your precious name we pray. Amen. is taken from the Gospel of John, John chapter 11. John chapter 11, and for those of you who in your homes are following along, may I encourage you to leave your Bibles open. I want to highlight uh, passages or verses uh, throughout the entire chapter of John 11. Though our focus this morning is found particularly in verses 38 through 44, and I would like to read those for us at this time. John 11, beginning at verse 38. Jesus, 
once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So far in the reading of God's word, as I said, I, I, I want to look at the entire chapter because it, it holds together and, and it helps us to understand particularly these um, these last verses that uh, I just read for us. But before we even do that, I, I want to remind us of the reason for John writing his gospel. John tells us in, I believe it is John chapter 20, the closing verses, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing now. John says he could have written many other things regarding the life and the ministry of Jesus. But he says, I've written these things in order that you might believe, and that's key, that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God sent by the Father and that by believing in him, you might have eternal life. That's the reason for John writing his gospel. He wants us to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, sent by the Father to accomplish the purpose of the Heavenly Father, and namely the redemption of creation and of God's people, and that those who believe in Jesus, for those who believe in Jesus being the Son of God sent by the Father, there is the promise and the hope of eternal life, abundant life. The other theme that I want us to keep in mind as we listen to this 11th chapter of John is something that John writes in the very first chapter when he writes, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us and we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So John is testifying to the one who was sent by the Father, the one, Emmanuel, God with us, the one who came, the word that came in the flesh, in order that we might behold the very glory of God. I'm also reminded of the words of Jesus to one of his disciples in that Last Supper setting in the gospel where one of his disciples says, you know, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus responds by saying, how long have I been with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, for I and the Father are one. That theme of Jesus being with the Father, being one with the Father, being sent by the Father, in order that we might behold the glory of God and God's purpose and plan for the redemption of his people, for the redemption of the world. That is central. It's the central theme, not only of the Gospel of John, but of the very Bible itself, the very Word of God. And so I want to take just a few moments, and I want to work through this Gospel account of uh, the resurrection or the raising of Lazarus. We read that Jesus is... Uh, 
some distance from where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus lived. And, and Lazarus is, is very ill. And so the sisters send a message to Jesus saying, the one that you love is very sick. And then we read that Jesus uh, says, well, this sickness is, is not unto death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Reminded here again of what Jesus says in, in, uh, in John chapter 9, in the raising, or not the raising, but the, uh, the giving of sight to the blind man. And uh, once again, that, that question comes uh, who sinned, this man or his parents, that, that he was born blind? And Jesus says, neither, but that you might be able to behold the work of God, which is another way of saying that you might be able to behold the glory of God in giving sight to the blind. And so you have this, what appears to be somewhat strange, enigmatic statement of Jesus that Lazarus is, um, you know, his, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory. And then, then you have Jesus, or you have John writing as kind of a, a footnote, if you will. Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary and Lazarus. And yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, it seems a little strange if you, you, you read that Jesus loved Lazarus. He loved Mary and Martha. You would think that he would have made every effort to, uh, certainly he could, have, he could have spoken a word like he did with the uh, official son in, in John chapter 4 when he, he said to the official, your, your son is healed. He didn't even go to the, to the official's home. Jesus could certainly have done that. Or at the very at least Jesus could have uh, left with his disciples immediately. But he stays the extra two days. And so that's why John writes that Jesus loved them. He, he wants us to know that this has nothing to do with the fact that Jesus loved them less or didn't care about them. But, but he wants to set this scene, if you will, for us in such a way that we come to understand that Jesus in his ministry is driven by the purposes and the plan of God the Father. And in the purpose and plan of God the Father, Jesus is going to perform this miracle of raising someone from the dead. This, by the way, is the seventh sign. There are seven signs in the Gospel of John. The very first of those signs is in John chapter 2. It's changing the water into wine. The second sign is Jesus raising that nobleman's or official son. When he says to him, your son is healed, you can go home. The third sign is John chapter 5, where uh, Jesus heals the paralytic, the man who was paralyzed for some 38 years. In John chapter 6, we read of Jesus feeding the 5,000 and then walking on the water. And then we read in John chapter 9, Jesus giving sight to the man who was born blind. And now this, the seventh sign. And hopefully you've heard enough sermons to know that seven in the, in the biblical record is an important number. It's, it's, a number of full, it's a number that usually represents or conveys the idea of fullness. And so this is the seventh sign. It is the culmination, if you will, of the signs that, that Jesus performed. And John says he could have written about many others. He could have written about many other so-called miraculous healings. But these seven he's recorded, all of which in their own way demonstrate something of the fact that Jesus truly is God. Each and, each and every one of these signs is, is demonstrative of the power that Jesus has that only God has. Only God can work the kind of miracles or signs that Jesus performs. 
And ultimately, the great sign is this seventh sign, namely bringing someone back from the dead. Then we read that Jesus stays those extra couple of days, and that's important for another reason. It's important because in this day and or in that day and age, when unlike today, when we have all of our medical equipment that tells us whether someone is alive, whether they have brain waves or or what have you, when a person died at this particular point in time in history and was laid in a grave, it was very common for the family to go and to sit by that grave and to call out that person's name for at least three days. Because somehow it was believed that at least in that three-day period, the spirit was close enough to that person's human body that that person may still be alive. There, there was no way to, uh, to prove medically that such a person had truly uh, died. And so uh, this, this fourth day in this particular period of time in history was, was a way of saying that would have been certainly understood by the culture, by the people of that time, by referencing the fourth day. By the fourth day, it was believed that this person is not going to come out. This person is truly dead. And that's important. It's important because otherwise some people might suggest that Lazarus uh, was simply in a coma. He was like a person who had died, but, but was still really, his heart was still breathing, and, or his heart was still pumping blood, and he was still breathing. It's the, it's the, it's the way to convey, for John to convey the, the all-important truth that Lazarus was truly dead. Then we read that Jesus goes, and, and he's met by Martha, and uh, one ought not to make a great deal of this. I'm, you know, I don't like reading between the lines. But just the way in which John records this would certainly suggest that Martha's a little upset. Martha confronts Jesus by saying, you know, if you had only been here, you know, we sent that message several days ago, if you had only come right away, if you had only been here, I know that you... you you could have healed our brother. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha reflecting a fundamental truth within the Jewish Hebrew community of that time. Says, well, I know. I know that Jesus will, or I know that my brother Lazarus will be raised in the last day. And then Jesus says to her, but I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And her answer is a very beautiful confession. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. This is exactly what John reminds us of in John chapter 20. This is the confession that that is so fundamental, it is so important. Martha is saying exactly what John wants all of us to be able to say in genuine, heartfelt truth, you are the Christ. After she makes that confession, then she sends a message to Mary, her sister, saying um, the rabbi or the teacher is here and he wants to talk to you. And, and we read that uh, Mary gets up and, and, and she leaves their home and the assumption is on the part of those who are there comforting her that, that she is going to go to the tomb. Let me just pause here for just a moment. You know, what's interesting is that uh, in its own kind of quiet, sometimes subtle ways, the Bible uh, conveys uh, important little truths to us if we would only stop to listen and pay attention. Mary is being comforted by the community at such a time as this. And I think that's an important message for all of us, and maybe especially at this time. A pastoral counselor made the observation, which I think is very much on target, that 
Really, when it comes to it, pastoral care is simply 90% showing up. People are so worried about going to bring a message to someone who has lost a loved one or in this situation going to uh, the Hoffman family and what do I say, what, you know, in a situation like this. Just a little bit of advice for what it's worth. You don't need to say anything. And unfortunately, in today's uh, environment, the greatest tragedy of all is that you can't do what probably is the most important thing, and that is just simply to give a hug. And so I, I just I call it to our attention because I think it is, it is it, it's certainly not the central part of the text, but I think it's an important part of what we need to gain when we read through the scriptures. And, we, and these things are not, um, you know, they're, they're not... Uh, there for us to simply to pass over. And so uh, we read that, that, that Mary comes to Jesus and, and in a much different way uh, comes and doesn't challenge Jesus right away. She falls at his feet and I believe in a much more humble uh, kind of way raises the same question. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and, and, and saw uh, the, the crowd that was weeping, you, you have this, uh, this kind of, yeah, strange way of conveying uh, something about the humanity of Jesus that sometimes gives people a little bit of a problem. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And that's an understatement. The word translated there, troubled, could far better be translated, he was irate, he was angry. And now the question is, what, what would he be angry about? What would he be irate about? Is he mad because Martha and Mary just don't trust him or that they don't believe that he's able to do greater things because he is the Messiah? Is he angry about the fact that uh, this uh, crowd of people who have gathered on this occasion... Uh, do not still believe that he is the Son of God, the Messiah? Well, we can't rule that out, that Jesus may have been upset or somewhat angry about the fact that there were those who simply did not believe fully that he was who he claimed to be. But I believe that the passage is better understood as a way of simply saying that Jesus, Jesus seeing how death comes into the Father's world and brings about the kind of pain and the kind of sorrow that it does. Jesus, the one who was with the Father at the creation, the one who was able to hear those powerful words recorded for us in Genesis chapter 1, and after God had made everything, he said, and it was good. Now, this is the one who the scriptures tell us, this is the one who was with the Father at the beginning. This is the wisdom that created the heavens and the earth and all of the components of the world and the universe as we know it. And after everything was created, after all six days of creation and ultimately creating man in God's own image, we read that, and God was able to say, at that culmination of the sixth day, it was not only good, but it was very good. And now, Jesus, because sin came into the world, because of the disobedience of Adam and Eve, and the consequences of sin, beginning already with the brokenness of the relationship between Adam and Eve, and then you have Cain killing his brother Abel, and and you have the, 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 the opening record of a polygamous relationship by the seventh generation from Lamech, the seventh generation, I should say, from Cain, namely Lamech. And, and then you have this, this, this constant record of, of bloodshed and, and oppression and a culminating in the early record of Genesis and the fact that God grieved himself God, God was grieved because he had made the world. 
and the consequences of, of, of the fall into sin. I believe all of that is part of this, being deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And Jesus understands what, what lies ahead for him, namely the cross. What lies ahead, namely to be able to, to address man's greatest need, his deepest need, namely reconciliation. Namely to be able to restore that which was fallen. You have that same reference once again in verse 38 when we read for this morning, Jesus once more deeply moved. You have that, that same word being used here. Once again being deeply moved, he comes to the tomb. I don't know, maybe because of those drawings that you have in some of the older Sunday school papers. I don't know what image comes to your mind, but I always had this image of a great big old cave and this huge boulder that, that was there, and sometimes the angel sits on top of that huge boulder. One of the things I appreciated was that Mary and I had the opportunity, my wife and I had the opportunity to go to, the, um, to Israel with Ray Vanderlaan. And uh, we were able to go to, uh, it certainly was not the same, but it was a very similar cave um, that would have housed Lazarus. And, 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 and it, was a, it, it, it is a cave, it's, it's hewn out of the rock, uh, but the, the stone that is in front of it is more like a wheel, and, and it's in a kind of a trough. And, and, it, and, and, you, and you roll it back in order to enter in, and, um, and then you roll it to, to, to seal it. And my understanding is, from, from Ray and from my reading, is that the understanding would be that you, you go, like I said, for those three days, and after the third day, you would no longer go there after calling out the person's name because clearly the person is dead now. And, uh, and that person's body would be in that tomb for probably a couple of years, and then you would roll that stone back, and you would go in, and, and you would take the bones out, and put it in an ossuary, a, a kind of a wooden box, and um, that's how you would, you know, store those bones. Of, and I'm not sure what the history of that is, but uh, but the understanding is that you would then reuse that cave for 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 other people. Anyway, I don't want to get sidetracked, and I just want us to to kind of visualize this this this. Um, setting in which you have this stone it can easily well, not easily but can be rolled away and and the body placed inside and so jesus comes to this tomb and he and he says to those who are there i want you to to take away the stone now what what i what i want us to just dwell on because i think this is this is critical for all of us but lord said martha by this time, there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Okay? Now I'll go back to that earlier conversation between Martha and Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, because I, I know you could have healed him. But even now, but even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. That's a beautiful confession. But does she really believe it in her heart of hearts? Even now. And then Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. But don't roll that stone away. Don't, don't roll us because, because he's been in there for four days and, and his body is by now uh, rotting away. Uh, by this time, there's a bad odor. To which Jesus says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then you have this prayer of Jesus and you have Jesus himself explaining why he says the prayer out loud. Not for his father's sake, not for his sake, but for the sake of those who are there. 
in order that they may know that the Father has sent Jesus and that the Father has sent Jesus in order that Jesus might be the one who conquers sin and death. And so they roll the stone away. Jesus calls out like what normally would have happened for those three days. Lazarus come out. And the dead man comes out. And you have uh, this beautiful symbolism here of Jesus saying, now take off the grave clothes and set him free. Let him go. Now, as I said, this is the seventh and final sign, and it is, it, is an, it is anticipating the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ himself. It is that seventh sign that points in the direction of what God is going to accomplish in and through Jesus Christ. Lazarus, an incredible sign coming back out of the grave. What, a, what, a, what an incredible sign. What an incredible gift. What an incredible miracle of seeing a loved one come back from the dead. But it's only a sign of something much greater. It's only a sign of something that far outshadows this one particular incident because we know that Lazarus eventually will face death again. But because of Easter, but because that the plan and the purpose of God in sending Jesus, sending his only begotten son, because of the cross and the empty tomb and the, and the coming forth of Jesus, the very son of God, and his ascension into heaven, Jesus, who is able to say from the cross, it is finished, it is complete. You and I are able to behold the very glory of God himself. Because you see, we not only have the record, we not only have the biblical record of Jesus raising Lazarus, we not only have the record of the Bible that says to us Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I can and certainly ought to be able to testify to the fact that our very lives are evidence of that resurrection. It'd be pretty hard to get an amen when we don't have a congregation here, but I'd like to think that at this point in time in the message, folks would say amen. Our lives, the very fact that, that you and I can face today, tomorrow, that, that you and I can face the future with all of the uncertainties, that you and I can face even the toughest, most difficult trials in life, and that we can face it not with some blind faith, not with some whistling in the dark and whistling through the cemetery that, well, I sure hope things can work out, but that rock solid assurance, that conviction that says my only comfort in life and death is that I'm not my own, that I know that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can separate me from the love of God, that I know that even in the midst of this, this pandemic, even in the midst of facing life with all of its challenges, even the challenge of, of, of cancer that eats away at the body, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I know that because the Bible testifies to it and I've experienced it in my own life. For you and I ought to be able to testify to the fact that once you and I were dead in our sins and trespasses, but now have been made alive, that you and I know what it's like to live new lives as new creatures in Jesus Christ. 
so that you and I are able to say, as John wants us to say, yes, Lord. I believe that not only you are the resurrection and the life, but I believe that you have raised me. And that someday, I will pass through this thing called death and I will live for all eternity with the one who died for me. Let us pray. Lord, we cannot find words adequate enough to express the gratitude that should be overflowing in our hearts and lives. Because we know that you not only are the very Son of God who came into the world so that we might behold the glory of God, you are the one who raised Lazarus from the dead. You are the one who raises us up. You raise us up from our fallenness you create within us a new heart and a new life. And we know that we can face tomorrow, we can face all of the uncertainties of life itself, knowing that there is absolutely nothing that can separate us from the Father's love. We have not only beheld the glory, we have experienced the very glory that God has promised and that someday, in that new heaven and new earth, we will be able to experience that glorification for all eternity. There are simply not words to express the wonder, the grandeur, the splendor of that message. Hear our prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. As we leave this place, as we leave our homes, as we go about our activities, even with all the limitations that are there, may we face each new day, each new opportunity of service in our Father's kingdom with these words of assurance that he pronounces over us, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the abiding fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen.